Namaste. Well, it's been a long series, <laughs> 40 something videos already in this Lakshmi Tantra series. And we're halfway through the book now. So because I'm having trouble with my eyes, I have to take a break from doing these intensive videos. There's so much pre-production and so much literary work involved in editing, reconstructing, first of all, the text and then editing it so that it's good contemporary English usage. And I'm, you know, slowly getting cataracts and my eyes are getting weak and dim. I'm 74 years old, so that's expected. And um, I'm starting to get like eye strain headaches, so I have to stop. I'll still continue to do these more informal type of videos, and uh, I think you like them better anyway because looking at the stats, uh, the uh, textual videos where I go to the direct text only get about half the views. So, you know, if I have to cut something out, that's what it's gonna be. I'm not gonna to promise to do the rest of the book. I'm gonna do some easier things for a while. It's just too much work. And I wanna spend more time in meditation because that's where the real happiness is. And, uh, you know, you all are smart people. You can download the original text and you can download my edited version. The links to them both are in this video description down below here. And you should also watch the original text videos for chapter 22, chapter 23, and chapter 24. Otherwise, you don't have any context for these talks and you're just listening to my opinions without any reference to the original. You know, it's always best to do your own research. Go direct to the original source and digest whatever you can. You know, maybe you won't get it all on the first reading and that's all right. Maybe it takes at least three or four readings and looking up your misunderstood terms, you know, using the Sanskrit dictionary and finding out the meanings of everything. That's what I do. And that's what I have done in this whole series. And that's how come I can discuss it intelligently. I hope it's intelligent anyway. <laughs> Be that's another thing. I'm not getting enough feedback. You know, I've been talking about this since the beginning of this channel. I'm not getting enough feedback to understand how much of this the viewers are understanding and how much of it is going over their heads <laughs> or in one ear and out the other, even worse. So it's hard for me to gauge, you know, what level to make the presentation on. When I started this channel, my intent from the beginning was to make it a graduate or even postgraduate level seminar where I can go from talking about ancient Sanskrit rituals to quantum mechanics in a single leap and most people can follow me. But as it turns out, it's not so. I don't know where those people are, the really smart people, but they're not on this channel. At least if they are, they're lurking and they don't make any comments. So I don't get any really good questions. I don't get any real searching inquiries, you know, trying to really go to the essence of what this is all about. So I think in the future, I'm just going to stick to the simpler, uh, less elevated topics, because that's what seems to resonate with more of the viewers. 
And I'm also going to change the presentation style so that the reading and the explanation are both in the same video, so you can't skip the reading. Ha ha. <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about 22, 23, 24. The important thing concept in chapter 22 is that mantras are not all the same. They have at least three categories, inferior, middling, and superior. And then she goes on to give the criteria for how you determine what class a mantra is. And so the simple cult mantras uh, without a bija, and just aimed at one single deity are, are third-class mantras. Then the mantras that may have one bija and uh, one or two sangya terms and are aimed at a, a deity within the Pancharatra system, in other words, a Vaishnava deity, those are considered second class. But the first class mantras are those that have either numerous bijas or are only composed of bijas and may or may not even indicate a specific deity, but are aimed at the uh, Brahman itself. And these are mantras like Mahashodashi, uh, Tara Mantra, Aum. And so these are very rare, actually. There's only a few of them. And she goes on later to tell Aum, Hring, Shring, and some other mantras, some other Bija mantras, actually, that are connected with different deities. So she's definitely saying here that one of the aims of the Pancharatra is to uh, create a higher level teaching, higher than the four Vedas even. And why is that? Well, the four Vedas talk a lot about rituals. And in those rituals, they're mainly aimed at the demigods and at the attainment of some material wealth or opulence. And she says, no, there's a level above that. That's the Pancharatra series. And there's even a level above that, which are the first class mantras. So the way I interpret this is that the Vedas are primarily karma yoga. Their aim is to engage people in spiritual, you know, sort of spiritual activities, at least higher activities, um, with the enticement of material benefits. Worship Indra and you get power. Worship Varuna and you get wealth and so on. These are the main deities in the Vedas. Then in Vedanta, the actual goal is revealed to be Brahman and Upanishads too. So this is a higher level. So then the Pancharatra system looks to me like it's meant to concentrate on bhakti, which if you follow our series of four steps huh, based on the four stages of consciousness, this is when the emphasis goes from jagrat, or waking consciousness, to svapna, or dream consciousness. And anybody who does any Sri Vidya sadhana can tell you, as they've told me, <laughs> and I've also experienced myself, that the quality of your dreams changes markedly by doing Sri Vidya sadhana, by cultivating bhakti for the universal divine mother, 
she starts to show up in your dreams and transform their quality. And I have to tell you, I haven't had like a negative dream in, I don't know, so long I can't even remember it. All my dreams now are very friendly and positive, huh? And waking up in the morning, what I remember of them, I don't always remember them all. Are, they're just, you know, such a better quality than I've ever had in my whole life. But then what? The next stage after bhakti is raja yoga or meditation. So the whole point, I think, of the Pancharatra system is to prepare you for the meditation. Because meditation, remember, all these levels have some prerequisites. You can't just jump up to where you'd like to be. You'll just fall down again. So when you're truly ready for meditation, you'll get a craving for it that you can't ignore. It's like a hunger. You have to satisfy it. You have to sit down on that asana and do the thing. And I'm going to make some videos on how you do meditation and all that. But first, you see, the whole purpose for this series and so many others over the last two years or so is that I could see, I could understand that the primary problem in spiritual life amongst English-speaking people is that they want to jump up to meditation before they have completed the prerequisites. Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. So I started the uh, series, various different series on uh, Sri Vidya in order to engage the watchers in these preliminary stages of karma and bhakti. And I very much, over the last couple of years, de-emphasized series on Brahman and meditation and topics like that. Well, now I think there's enough material that I have filled in that gap. And I'm going to be returning to some topics on meditation and Brahman. But with the caveat, always, that your karma yoga and bhakti yoga has to be complete before you can even start talking about meditation. If meditation is an effort, it's not the real thing. And it can't give the actual result of meditation, which is realization of Brahman. Like I said, meditation has to be a hunger. It has to be a need. You have to feel like, oh, I just, I just want to like shut the door, turn off my phone, and sit, and let whatever happens happen. And this is the stage when we truly surrender, which is what Ma is talking about here. Sharanagati, or prapati, means self-surrender, unconditional. That we understand that all the tattvas, all the ingredients of the material creation, and even consciousness itself, is her. The mind, memories, karma, activity, everything is her. So if everything is her, what are we? That's the question. <laughs> this means we have to completely surrender to her because she is everything, including what we normally consider as myself. So if that's the case, then, <laughs> and she will reveal that. If you, if you pray to her earnestly, she will reveal this. And you will realize that, oh my God, there is nothing but her, and there is really no room for this thing called I. Huh? So then what comes after that is the realization that I have to do something about this. 
and doing something about it is what meditation is all about. And so with that, I'd like to conclude part one, the first half of Lakshmi Tantra series. And I wish that you all will go through the original text and also my edited copy, which is easier to read, and understand these things, test them, experience them in your own life, because that's how you get the benefits. Uh, spiritual life is not a spectator sport. <laughs> it's a hands-on, practical, direct, personal experience of the highest, full enlightenment. Aum Tatsa, Aum Shakti, Aum.